here is some piece of code o open mp code okay um, since i can read the back thing i hope you can read the front thing let everybody find out the error slash errors anybody still need more time yes no thing is then that it will do that block right the compiler not generate compiler is why should compiler generate an error i mean this looks easily figurable like this. <laughs> <laughs> we want to make compilers intelligent no but uh, the compiler doesn't necessarily know what omp set log does Does not, does not know the semantics does not know the semantics okay uh, so as many of you have figured out and hopefully all of you have almost figured out there will be a deadlock oh no there can be a deadlock um because one locks a and then b without releasing a and the other locks b and then looks for a okay Lo tries to lock a right so if this guy locks a while this guy has locked b then both of them are waiting for each other's locks right or each other to release the lock they have acquired but they can can't release because they need another lock before they are going to release anything okay what so that's the more clear error there is also a, a subtle error which again will depend eventually whether or not that error surfaces because after all in this case if you deadlock you don't know what's going to happen so the variables a and b are shared right yes so No flushes. So the output will be non-deterministic because of non-flushes. Yeah. Is anyone like we don't know which session will be required for this? So the idea is that either we are going to AI or we are going to AI. You know which one is available. That is. yeah if if the deadlock doesn't happen and that happens that is your semantics issue right maybe that's what you want Th that either this should get added to that or that should get added to this which got added first you don't know that not non determinism is not and it's not necessarily an error it might be uh, because i don't know with the i have no idea what these variables mean so i i can't say but there are some things i can say looking at this code and that's the variable i okay the variable i is declared outside and so it says variables declared if the variable i is declared outside then both of them are going to change the same now you may be able to get by if it is in a critical section if the entire for is in a critical section then one guy goes from 0 to n and then the next guy sets it to 0 and goes to n again okay so we request flushing for not the no auto flush no sir okay here are some examples this is the example that uh, the first one we've already seen the in fact the second one also we have seen but i had a a non conforming loop here i had uh, i less than n or done early okay so i basically have removed that extra condition and now this is a proper loop but it's still doing the same thing right it's saying for i equal to uh, this is inside a parallel for for i equal to 0 to n i want to evaluate something on i some function f0 okay and inside that function f0 for some reason you may quit early you may not necessarily evaluate it all the way to the end okay 
At the end of it, because it is last private, what will the done early contain? Whether or not the nth or n minus first or the thread width which does, did i equal to n minus 1 got done early. Okay. Now, there may be a, there is some hidden semantics here which says that done early means 3 knows that we don't need, at, at 3 it was done. So, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 were not required to be done. Okay. But if 3 got done, 3 was going to determine that it was done early, then 4 would have done the same, 5 would have done the same, 6 would have done the same, uh, n minus 1 would also have figured out that done early was true. Right? So, 0 to i, for 0 to sum, one of the i values would have computed it, i on i equal to that value plus 1 up to n minus 1 would not have. And if I only want to know if it got done early, if I am not interested in where it got done, then this is going to work just fine. Because if the last one got done early, then either the last one was the one that got done early or one of its predecessors got done early. Either way, it got done early. No. Right. Um, again, this is a little contrived, so that that's maybe the reason why you're finding it hard to digest. Everybody is trying to do something. Okay. And during doing that something, they realize that they actually didn't have to do it. Okay. For example, um, everybody is trying to look for uh, some bad guy and uh, they determine looking at the context around it that the bad guy is, has already been found. Okay. So, i equal to 0 looks for it, does not find it, i equal to 1 looks for it, does not find it. They are happening in parallel. Yes. So, 0 did not find it. At the same time, 1 did not find it. At the same time, 2 did not find it. At the same time, 3 found it. Because 3 found it, that <laughs> internal logic says that everybody else, it would not set anything. But if 3 found it, everybody else would also have found it. So, that is the, the, the semantics. That is the semantics. Right? It says that is the result done early. Yes. Listen to my story, then <laughs> ask your questions. Everybody is evaluating this done early. And if I evaluate done early equal to true, that means everybody I greater than equal to my value who is guaranteed to evaluate it to true. If O guarantees it. That's my story. You write your own. <laughs> so, okay. who guarantees it? The F0. Semantics. Uh, yeah, there's inside F0. Okay. So, that's the, the semantics. Whatever they are doing, if I figure out that done early was true, then I know that I after me is also going to figure out done early is equal to true. Okay. And at the end of it, all I want to know is was done early true for anybody. If it was true for the last guy, it was somebody, true for somebody. Right? So that is all this is saying. That I just need to check if the last guy saw, saw done early equal to true. Because if last guy did, then somebody before it may or may not have found it, but at least we know that somebody did. Last guy meaning the last thread or? Last iteration. Last iteration. Okay? Okay. So that is my story and I am sticking to it. Here is an example of ordered construct. Um, pragma OM, sorry. So ordered always comes inside something else. Ordered always comes inside something else. And it is inside section or uh, for. Um, so it says pragma OMP for ordered for i equal to 0 to n. If I am member of group A, do it, pragma OMP ordered. Otherwise, do it to the partner, whatever that partner is. 
some other i. Partner i evaluates to one of the other indexes. So yeah, so hope, uh, I'm assuming that is group A is uniquely going to identify everybody. So people are not members of A and B and C and D. Either you are a member of A or you are not. Okay. So those who will evaluate to group A will do the first order. Those who don't will do the second order. Anything wrong with it? Sometimes you enter the if sequential execute on the region i. And all threads which enter the else sequentially execute based on again or i. And those two are not linked. Two are actually linked. Are all they are they are all going to be sequentialized? Right? What that says is, if I have reached an order, then every index before me has gone out of the ordered, of not the order, of their order. Okay. In fact, even not their order, they have, they have, they are not going to come here in this order. Okay. So that's the more accurate way of looking at it. They are not going to encounter this order. Don't really mean if they are in the so, they don't encounter um, that order. Okay. So uh, in the sequential order, uh, one and partner of two would execute before three. But here, let's say that one is in group. A and 2 is not. Then before 3 occurs, 1 and partner of 2 would have occurred. But in this parallel ordered case, then... Is the same. Your, uh, it is. There is still a guarantee. But uh, 1 and 2 are in different uh, sections, right? So That's the thing. That there, These are not different sections. It's basically saying that that section is that part of code is to be done sequentially. This part of the code is also to be done sequentially. That means these are together to be done sequentially. It doesn't say that. That's the semantics. So there can be exactly one order inside the Either of them. Inside the parallel for there can be only one order. One, yes. That is precisely true. This is not allowed. Why? Because both of the orders have to be, it's part of the same order, right? Because there is no section, ordered section, right? Anything that comes in the ordered group, when you reach there, you have to make sure that all and anybody before you is not going to reach there. Okay? Now, if I have first order, then the second order is part of the same section. It's not that I have to cross this order and then there's a new ordered. So this ordered and that ordered are, I can't be at both places at the same time. Which means that I can't get there and here, which, which both required zero to appear first. Zero, zero, let's talk about index wise. So index zero has to go through this first and has to go through that first. And hence, this is not going to be allowed. So, you are able to say by mutual exclusion that if and else? Uh... No. That uh, you have, as a programmer, have to make sure. The, the next slide was an error. Next slide is, a... yeah, next slide is definite. This is definitely an error. A compilation. compilation. It is, yes. In this case, it can be syntactically determined. Right? Uh, if there is an if statement, it may or may not warn you. The short story is that both the do and do, both of these things are ordered, okay, part of the same order, okay. Every thread is allowed to encounter at most one order. If you do not encounter an order, you just go on. 
Okay. If you do encounter an order, then it's as if all the orders are part of the same, although you're not executing all pieces of code in this case, um, if you're in group A, you're not going to do the second half of the code, but that's also part of the same order. Right? It's like there is one ordered section, you may execute some piece of it, but that ordered section you can get to only if all indexes before you have got there. Okay. Over here as well, even at runtime, how would it whether I can do this? Because I took the first uh, tag map going to order. Yes. I look at all the orders that are there. And I'll say, oh, uh, I'm not. if I do this now, I will not be able to do that. I mean, how do you even at runtime absorb this? No, runtime is basically syntactic. Two orders next to each other without an intervening parallel for, uh, OMP parallel, are just not allowed. Even this is not allowed. But this is not, uh, well, not intervening uh, parallel, right? This would be allowed because they are not next to each other in the same block. They are in different control paths. They are in different control paths. So how will it determine there is the different control paths? That's what compiler does. It figures out the control flow graph and says this is one block of code, this is another block of code, and there is a jump between them. Okay, So if these two happen to be in the same block of code, then that's not allowed. So given what I told you, if there is an ordered construct, let's look at this again. Uh, sir, before uh, I just want to ask one thing: that this uh, whole thing would be inside some parallel construct. Right? This, this is inside uh, the so OMP four would make sense only inside an OMP parallel. Yes, so I'm going to modify this code a little bit. I'm going to remove the pragma OMP ordered in the else part. What do you think will happen? It is allowed actually because it doesn't know who is going to evaluate. To his group A, maybe everybody values to his group A. Nobody goes there. For a thread, for example, the preceding thread did not enter the uh, if part, so it will keep waiting that it will go over that will never get through that code because it will never enter that code. Exactly. So it is possible that somebody doesn't encounter the ordered clause at all, he will proceed. But any index after it, which is waiting for the ordered clause and asking if that guy got here or not, is never going to get past that point. Okay. All right. Um, matrix multiplication. Simple example. Um, get rid of the pragma OMP parallel for, and that is regular m cross n, no, n cross n matrices a and b are getting multiplied and the result is gain, getting placed in. I want to parallelize it. I just put that thing at the top. What happens? How well does it work? Is it correct or not? So the, the top four is really the four struct, right? And so for some different i is the variable for that for and different values of i will get allocated to different threads. In this case, the default is static. Number of uh, the chunk size is not being given. So everybody, every thread is going to get one fraction, some set of i, okay? one over the number of processors I have or n over the number of processors I have. And then they'll compute so many rows of the um, result, C. What if I have lots of processors? Everybody can do multiplication and then you can sum up also. Right, I put another for. So when the first gets encountered, you create some threads. Second gets encountered, each of those rows will get bro broken into blocks. 
Okay. Now everybody is computing one block of data. One position. Hmm. One position if I have got n cross n processors. If it is n cross n, if it is fewer than n cross n, then one block. I haven't said what num threads should be. Uh, the number of threads, multiple of existing threads. Sir? I'm not sure I understand your question. How many threads should be run? It, it depends on the task at hand, right? If, you, if each thread has a lot to do, um, then you do want more threads. Um, because when it has a lot to do, there's more likely chances of it getting cache misses, it get waiting for something to happen. If it is just addition of two things, uh, then probably they are all awaiting the same amount. And so it doesn't necessarily make sense to do lots of, or, or for that matter, if there is just con compute intensive, you're uh, iterating over the same piece of data, a small set of data again and again and again. Um, in that case, you're probably just running the CPU as fast as you can, in which case nobody is waiting, in which case you would want as few threads as number of processors. But again, in general, for most applications, uh, you want to be somewhere between five to six, maybe even five to 10, I would say, uh, times for Intel type architecture. Right? If you're talking about uh, GPU type architecture, then we are going from 10 to 100, maybe. It doesn't context switch in GPU. Okay, um, so you can do this also. You can have every single element being further, or every single element or a block of elements, being further broken into all the products that that has to do with the products being redu reduced by a sum. Okay. Um, I am going to stop here now talk about models of computation today. Um, so we do models of computation. We do it even in the sequential uh, computation. The idea is that you can uh, simplify, so you can write pseudocode that means something. Right? You have a notion of an underlying abstract level architecture without worrying about what the actual instruction set is, um, how much memory I have, and things of that sort. Right? So you're carrying over the same thing to parallel computation world. Um, you want to be able to specify programs in this model, reason that they are correct, argue that they are correct, figure out how many steps they take, okay, once we determine what the step is. Um, so all of those are uh, going to be uh, the realm of the model, model of parallel computation. That's why we typically have a model of parallel computation that people can develop algorithms in this model and then you can port it or apply it to a given architecture. Of course, over time, the variety of single processor architecture has restricted itself to a very small set and that hasn't quite yet happened um, to the parallel architecture, although it's beginning to happen to an extent. Um, but irrespective of that, you will find that if you can specify an algorithm in the PRAM model, uh, it makes sense uh, to implement in some other architecture, which isn't quite PRAM. And I'll tell you what PRAM is shortly. Um, but the idea is to abstract away the details so that you're worrying about just the main high level uh, structure of the algorithm. One thing you would want, because you wanted to analyze performance, is that if you say that it's order n, or it takes n squared steps, it means something in the real world also. Okay. Um, to a large extent, even that is going to be true, in spite of the fact that we are going to make very gross uh, assumptions. Um, 
we will in general study only these two varieties of things right you've got shared memory or you've got distributed memory and uh, in a typical modern parallel computer you'll have a bit of both so we'll want to have a model that can uh, model shared memory architecture as well as uh, distributed memory architecture um, we will look at how the model that we are going to study first pram model uh, does that uh, but uh, eventually people come up with different models one representing the shared memory one representing um, the distributed memory architecture so we'll look at that space also a little bit uh, the other uh, dichotomy that you'll notice um, is synchronous versus asynchronous. For example, the PDAM model is a synchronous shared memory model. What that says is that all the processors somehow have a shared clock and they're proceeding uh, in a lockstep fashion. Not necessarily SIMD, but they know what has happened. They know that I am at step number 39. Asynchronous is their, at their own speeds. My step number 39 has nothing to do with your step number 39, um, which would be clearly more realistic, uh, but turns out to be not quite necessary. Although there, there are asynchronous shared memory models as well as synchronous. Similarly, there are asynchronous distributed memory models as well as uh, asynchronous. We will uh, probably not talk too much of asynchronous because it only complicates analysis uh, we can talk about it as a model, but we're probably never going to use it. So he, here is the basic PRAM model, which is an extension of the RAM model that you may have seen in the sequential domain. In uh, here, there is a memory that is shared by a number of processors uh, through some interconnect. Interconnect is essentially painted bl black here. It is a black box. We don't know how that communication to shared memory happens. Um, we just have a bunch of processors and a bunch of addresses which can be globally accessible to all of them. Okay. In addition, there may be some local memory. Each processor has a cache or whatever, something <coughs> that is not accessible to the other people. Okay. It's not shown here. It's part of P0 and P1 and P2 and so on. Um, just like in RAM model, we don't say there is so much memory, right? This is as much memory as you need. It's the same story here. There are as many processors as you need. There is as much memory as you need. There is as much local memory as you need. There is as much shared memory as you need. Okay, so that's the first um, abstraction. I won't say assumption. Uh, but it is an abstraction. We'll, we'll talk about how it affects our analysis. So, so uh, as many number of processors as you need, which means it, it is valid for a single processor to a machine of even millions of processors. Yes. Right. Right. Um, the, so one is the num amount of resources. How much memory I have, how much local versus or shared, how many processors I have. The other is their speed. Each Shared memory access can be done in a constant amount of time, which is exactly what you assume in the RAM model. Okay, there's no, it's local or it's in cache and uh, the like. Okay, any processor that wants to access any piece of memory, local or shared, it can do so in a single unit of time, whatever that unit may be, order one. Um, also, each processor knows its ID. So locally, it can determine that it's processor number three of whatever that size is, OK? Um, so what are the unrealistic parts here? What are, what is cell here? Cell is one memory location, one addressable memory location. Constant access is almost never going to uh, be possible, especially if you have anything more than six, seven processors. Um, even six, seven processors, it's not really constant. It may appear constant. What do you mean by constant? Like constant? Fixed. 
in fact it will be even more clear when we dig a little bit deeper constant is is clearly bounded right so when you say it is bounded yeah. with no reference to the size of the problem that's constant okay so it can be 1000 hours it is still constant we can't even validate that <coughs> well when we say that the number of processors is unlimited we cannot guarantee that in 1000 hours every single processor will be able to access every piece of shape because the number of processors may be many 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 more or many powers of thousand actually once we fix the number of processors why is not that constant it it may be uh, it may become larger but after all if you fix it it is possible to make it constant right but we are not fixing it we saying we 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 assume as many processors as we need and they are all able to access the same sh same shared memory in a constant amount of time constant is in the sense of uh, when there is one processor or when there is thousand processors the time access will be same that's the constant. no that's not what it means it means that when there are many processors they can each tell that i have to wait for a thousand hours to get to this exactly not a bound not a bound well the bound means that they can then pretend that they got it in thousand hours even if they got it in hundred they'll sleep for the remaining 900 hours um so it is unrealistic uh, both because of the constant assumption and the amount of resources assumption um constant is a little bit harder to um simulate on the other hand the truth is that you will have a bounded number of processors in reality and that will make the memory uh limit the memory size or, or the access uh latency constant um also it won't give you real performance because when when just like i said if you say that's 1000 hours and you only can get it in 100 you're sleeping for the 900 hours that's not what you would really do if you can get it in 100 you will want to do something useful for that those 900 hours if you do then the predicted performance won't necessarily be the same as what you observe okay so that constant will actually be a bound and it will not be a constant because sometimes you'll fetch it from somewhere nearby whereas sometimes you'll fetch it from somewhere far away okay um so here is a little bit more of the detail got uh, i'm not showing the local memory here local memory works just like it does in a sequential processor okay the shared memory is accessible by any number of processors and here i'm assuming that there are m cells whatever that m may be it depends on the algorithm not on the problem not on the given architecture it depends on the algorithm actually uh, which in turn may depend on the problem the number of processors n and each processor can access some memory location and a time step is defined thus in every time step you can read some memory cell do some local computation okay constant amount of local computation and then you can write a memory cell okay, so those three steps together uh, constitute a step like either of them can be either of them can be done in a step you could think of it that way Okay, you can say these are three steps. Um, One time step we can read, then the next time step we compute, and the next time step we write. We can do that. Here it's combined so that in that time step you you're completely uh, encapsulating that piece of work. Right? You have to read something, do something on it, and write it back. Okay. And this is atomic. And it's not that the entire three-step thing is atomic, but each of those is atomic. Right? Sorry. You can't have locks. Yeah. You don't need locks here. Not only can't have locks, you don't need locks. Okay, that's so one of the simplifications that has. In a problem different, algorithm different. You determine how many n you are going to assume, right? So you say, I, I, you, you want to give me n things to sort. I'll tell you if I had n processors. 
I would be able to sort in log of log n time. Okay, that's not right, um, but just for instance. <laughs> Um, I can say if you give me n squared processors, I can sort it in one time, constant time. Okay, so it depends on the algorithm. But the algorithms n will depend on the problem in turn. Uh, programmer, uh, doesn't he hear about the architecture? Before? Not, not here, right? We are abstracting away the architecture. So the, uh, the reasoning and analysis is going to be in the PRAM model. And then we'll see, right? It, it does eventually have to be implemented on architecture. It has to map to an architecture. And somehow it needs to make some sense for all architecture and at least a variety of architecture, if not all, OK? Um, so you read together. When you are reading, all the other processors are also reading. When you're writing, all the other processors are also writing. Okay. And so in constant amount of time, you can communicate data to somebody. Constant size data. Um, you write something, and the next step, you read something. No, but uh, since you are uh, mentioning that coaccess may be restricted, it might happen that somebody uh, wrote something, and because of these restrictions, the, the, the next step, the reading step, is deferred to some... I'll, t I'll tell you what coaccess is restricted means um, very shortly. Okay. Coaccess is restricted only means that there are varieties, categories of PRAM models where you may not be allowed to read uh, in uh, common, meaning that two cells, uh, rather two processors cannot read the same cell in the same clock. Okay, or cannot write in the same cell in the same clock. So nothing is deferred. It's just that the, in the model, you your programs are illegal if they write into the same thing. Okay, if you simply can't write such a program. There are m ports to the port. Every cell can be written. Um, Even can write to that. That's detail of the architecture. Uh, but yes, at the abstraction level, they all are writing to, to some locations. And in some model, those locations may overlap, may have some commonalities. In some model, they must be independent. But in, this, in, in the same clock, at the same time step, they'll all be written. OK? Um, all right. The input and output, and these are some of the technical requirements. How does it read input? How does it produce the final answer? Um, how do processors get started, right? It's like I have any number of processors as I need. How does an algorithm say I need n processors or n squared processors? Those are technicalities. We'll just assume that n squared processors are active if we need them. Uh, but there are ways in which you can always have processor 0 start up, and it activates the other processor. And then you have to add the count, the, the cost of activation in the total cost of the algorithm, right? If you're using more processors, it'll take more time to activate them and so on. Um, there is also a notion similar to RAM again, that there, are fixed, there is some default instruction set which we are not going into, right? like add, subtract. Basic operations that you may assume that can be done in order one are assumed here, right? So. Although I'm not going into that level of detail in what is the instruction set assumed, it's basically the same as RAM. You can't say that one of my instructions is sort and things, OK? Because then you can do this in order one time in this model. So that's not allowed. The instructions are basic instructions, whatever we uh, know and, and understand as basic instructions. Um, I already said processors are going to be synchronous, meaning they're all going to be reading then all going to be doing computation, then all going to be right. Okay. And asynchronous versions exist, um, which then require some synchronization at some point. Uh, in terms of the cost, right, clearly how many steps are needed will determine how expensive your algorithm is. And uh, so how many such steps of read, modify, write is needed. 
Um, similarly, cost of how many processors you're using is going to be important. And somehow those two maybe needs to be combined into one uh, number that says that's the quality of my algorithm. Um, and of course, the space that's typically related uh, in a trade-off sense to the amount of, uh, to the number of steps you need to take. Um, but again, just like, uh, especially in the beginning, we don't worry too much about how much space you're using. We focus mainly on how much uh, computation you do. We're going to do the same thing. We're not wor going to worry about how much shared memory we are going to assume. We worry about how many processors we have and how much computation they do. Okay, here are the restrictions that I was mentioned. Um, e stands for exclusive and C stands for concurrent. Okay, so one variant of the PRAM model is EREW PRAM model, which means that in that, if, if that's what you're assuming, then a read has to be exclusive, meaning two people can't read from the same location at the same time. And a write has to be exclusive. Similarly, two or more processors cannot write to the same location in the same clock. Okay. So you can read, but cannot write. That is the CREW model. Concurrent read, but exclusive write. Okay. So one processor is reading and one processor is writing and one processor, but another processor is reading. That's synchronous model, right? Everybody is in a read step or compute step or write step. So that that possibility doesn't exist in PRAM. That some is reading, some is writing. Okay. Um, ERCW is just for completeness here. Uh, you never argue anything in ERCW model because it's completely unrealistic. Um, you want exclusive read, but everybody can write together. That's allowed. So, uh, we, we, we're not going to talk about that after this slide. So just exclusive read means that uh, reading the entire shared memory or just that one, one location? One, right? Because otherwise, basically one processor is reading in one clock. That, that wouldn't make sense. Uh, and uh, CRCW is concurrent read, concurrent write. Okay. This is the most powerful model. Of course, requires the most amount of hardware also. So what do you mean Meaning that two processors can write to the same location in the same clock. But 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 Sorry? And it includes a modern. Um, there are further varieties of concurrent write. <laughs> um, and then you've got to assume one of them. Again, it depends on what the underlying architecture provides probably. Um, the variants are priority concurrent write, meaning that there is an inherent priority. And this is, in fact, one of the easiest to implement. Um, in, so, in, in some, so let me take that back. Not always. Um, it depends on the, under the hardware around it, but in some cases, it is uh, deceptively easy to implement. It says that if your processor ID is smaller, then you win. Whose processor ID is bigger doesn't get to write. Okay, it's just their write is just ignored, lost. The higher priority processor wins. Okay. Common is if they are all trying to write the same thing, then the write succeeds. Otherwise, nothing is written. Nobody, read, nobody writes. Okay. How do you know nobody writes? Or how do you know whether the thing you wanted to write got written? Next log, you can read it back, check, and you'll know. Um, this is also relatively easy to implement, arbitrary. Like lots of people are trying to write. Somebody's write will win. Again, you can check who got to write. Who got to write, but whether I got to write. No, no, no. Yes, correct. Not who got to write, but whether what I wanted to write got written. 
Um, PREW is the least powerful. CRCW priority is said to be the most powerful. Uh, so this is increasing power. What that means is that when you have priority, you can simulate a CRCW model, which is common. If you have that, that can simulate a CRCW model, which is um, random, which can simulate CREW, which can simulate ERW. Okay, And it should not be hard to imagine how you would simulate, right? How would a CRCW, CREW, let's say, simulate an ERW? What does this, what does an EREW do? It, only one, it makes sure by the structure of the program that only one is writing. Okay, so CREW, nothing happens. Only one person writes. Okay. How do you simulate, uh, let's say, common with priority? Common said, that it will get written only if everybody is trying to write the same thing. In priority, you can write even if these are different, and that uh, winner, whoever writes, has always a lower priority. So if k processors um, of the p are trying to write to the same location, the one with the highest priority will win. So you may not be able to simulate common with priority because in priority uh, we get you we, we find out the priorities of the processors that are there and we don't need to read the values right so there won't be a mechanism that will read the value in priority there is no need of having mechanism that will read the values that are being written. We just need the priorities. No, without reading, how can you write a program? I don't quite get it. The, the, the mechanism that is ensuring the priority... Uh... That mechanism need not exist in common, but we're not worrying about how, what that mechanism internally does. Right? One, I've got a PRAM machine, which is a CRCW priority PRAM machine. Okay? Somebody gave me a program that works in CRCW common. Can I run his program on this machine? Can I make some compiler modifications to his program so that it will run on this machine? In that program also, it's allowed for multiple people to write. But only if they all were writing the same thing, should it get written. Here, if they all write, one of their, their the highest priority one will win. It will, something will get written, written, even if they are not all the same. I didn't say how long it will take, but yes, it should be doable in constant time. What does simulation mean? So we can... Simulation means basically what I was more specific with. I want a compiler that will take that program and do something to it and run it on this machine so that the results ultimately are exactly the same as running that program on a PRAM that is a common CRCW. So it may add some more instructions? It can add some more instructions. In fact, it has to add some more instructions. E first can read the value. Each processor can read the value. So priority will win, right? Everybody try to write the priority one, and then there will be, in the next step, it will insert a new instruction, which will read it back and... It will write the different value that you want to write. If the uh, architecture given is uh, above common, so then how can priority be written? I mean, in the given architecture. The given architecture is priority. The program is of the common. So, so it could write the audio. It's the wrong right you. Undo it. If you know what was before that right, you can write it back. Right? So before you write, you have to read what is there. 
so that you can undo the write. So you've got the read done. When you read the original value, you write something if any of the processes no and then read. So if they doesn't doesn't they don't match in any processors, mm -hmm. then you can change this target from highest max and then again. So old value. All those which differ with the value like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is simple enough. It's, it's a good uh, exercise. Uh, I'll let you think about it and then uh, we'll talk about it again. Maybe after the break or maybe uh, the next class. Okay. Um, ERW would be the simplest template. Oh, wait. Uh, I said that because we were running out of time. I shouldn't have gone ahead. Uh, we're going to stop.